All right. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to NCSL's virtual meeting. Let's talk about voting outside the polling place. My name is Wendy Underhill, and I will be moderating this 60-minute meeting today. I'm the director of the Elections and Redistricting Team at the National Conference of State Legislatures. If, by any chance, you don't know what NCSL is, we are the bipartisan organization that supports the work of legislators and legislative staff throughout the nation. Behind the scenes, I am supported by Brian Hinkle. Brian, do you want to say hello? Um, hello, everyone. Yep. Uh, so Brian is sort of the engineer for this. And if you've been uh, communicating at all, it's been with him on, on this one. Um, please know that our job at NCSL is to provide legislators and legislative staff with information and analysis on elections, campaign finance, and redistricting. So you can ask us anything of that kind of nature at elections-info at ncsl.org, or you can ask us on any other topic, criminal justice, education, whatever's on your mind, and we will make sure your question gets to the right place. This meeting is the last in a four-part series on mail voting or absentee voting or voting at home. If you visit our website, you can find the recordings from the other three. What's been interesting is we've had different faculty throughout and um, each conversation has a little bit been a little bit different. So if your state is moving in the direction of encouraging more people to um, vote absentee or vote at home, then you might want to look at those others as well for additional perspectives and information. The whole package is super important right now because the topic is so important what with uh, COVID-19 uh, still, um, I was going to use the word rampaging, but working through our, our um, nation. So for today, we have four parts. First, Washington's Secretary of State Kim Wyman will tell us how elections are run in her state. Uh, hers is one of the five states that were conducting elections primarily by mail before the current uh, health crisis hit. We will hear about her experiences with sending out mail ballots and what other states can do, learn from her basically, to prepare for um, the expected increases in voting outside the polling place, uh, both in the primaries that are yet to come and in the general election. And then we'll hear from Amber McReynolds. She's the CEO of the National Vote at Home Institute and formerly the Director of Elections for Denver, Colorado. Amber will discuss recommendations for states that are expecting those significant increases in voting from home and best practices and the support that her organization can offer. She also has a new report out. I'm guessing that she'll um, point to that for us as well. And then we'll hear from Paul Gronke, um, professor of political science at Reed College. And for our purposes, more importantly, he's the founder of the Early Voting Information Center. He, more than anyone else in the nation, has been following the move towards uh, mail voting longer and in greater depth than anyone else. He'll uh, share with us some thoughts about the partisan effect of the shift to vote by mail. Spoiler alert, I'm fairly sure he'll say that it's not been, that there isn't such a shift. Turnout and what local election officials may have on their minds. And then after that, that's when you all come in. Uh, there'll be uh, three short presentations um, and then we'll go Q&A. And if you all don't ask questions, then this is gonna be a very short presentation. So be sure to get your questions in the chat box. If you want to ask your question out loud, then use the raise your hand function. Um, and if you want to put it in the chat box that you'd like to ask it out loud, that's fine too. So we're going to reserve the last half for that. And just for practicalities, this meeting is being recorded. It will be available on our website within a few days. Um, and you may have noticed that you are muted at this point. Um, this is to ensure minimal back ground noise, of course, and uh, please leave your mic on mute unless you are preparing to speak to the group, which we'll be happy to have you do. Um, that's it for setting us up. Uh, Secretary Wyman, are you all set to go? I am. I am. Well, thank you, Wendy. Uh, so I think it's your turn, Secretary. Can you? Uh, can you hear me? Great. Great. We're good. Okay. All right. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, in the next few minutes, I thought I would give you an overview of Washington's experience with vote by mail and how we arrived at this juncture in 2020 and the challenges that I see not only here in our state, but for all, all states across the country in this COVID-19 environment that we are going to be operating for our remaining primaries in the general election. 
So Washington State, I, I always like to begin by giving the context of how long it actually took Washington to evolve to vote by mail. And um, just because, you know, Professor Gronke uh, is here, I will admit up front that, of course, we were second in the country to Oregon in moving completely to vote by mail. But um, our evolution started in the early 1990s. And we had been uh, able to have people that were over 65 years old or people who were living with a disability be able to be a permanent absentee voter from about 1981 forward. And in 1993, new legislation went into effect that allowed any voter to be able to choose to be a permanent absentee voter. And this was really significant because a handful of counties, including mine, I, I used to work in Thurston County as the elections director and later the auditor. And so I got to be part of this evolution from the ground up. And um, in 1993, we had uh, two kind of remarkable things that could happen to a voter. First of all, they could choose to be permanent absentee, but the county could also do certain elections completely by mail. And at that time, uh, Thurston County really wanted to move forward with, with this. So we really proactively um, reached out to our voters and over the course of about five years conducted any election we could by mail. So by the late 1990s, about 60% of our voters chose to be a permanent absentee voter. And most of them had, had voted multiple times in a vote by mail election. And, uh, and our voters liked it by and large. Now I will tell you that there was a subset that uh, to this day don't like it. I don't think you ever make everyone completely happy with vote by mail options or voting at home options, but, uh, but our voters certainly liked it. And what we found really came to a head in 2004 uh, is that when you have that many um, permanent absentee voters, and I think the, the tipping point is 60%, uh, when six in 10 of your voters choose to get an absentee ballot every election, you're a vote by mail state or county and you just don't know it yet. Um, and so in 19 or 2004, we really saw this happen. Uh, we had the closest governor's race in the country's history out of uh, 2.7 million ballots cast after two recounts and a court case, our uh, winning governor candidate, uh, Christine Gregoire, won by 133 votes. I do not recommend this, by the way. Um, it was not a pleasant experience because uh, during that, that uh, all of those recounts and everything, it became apparent that the internal controls for our counties were not as robust as they should have been for vote by mail. And even uh, some of the controls at the polling places weren't as robust as they should have been. And so um, out of that, we, uh, I will never forget the legislative meeting we had with the chairs of our committee that heard election bills, uh, the, the House and Senate chairs, and, and they were trying to do some reforms. And every time they would suggest one, all of the county auditors around the table would say, no, you can't do that because of this. No, you can't do that because of that. And then finally, out of frustration, uh, then Representative, now Senator Hunt uh, said, well, what would work then? And kind of a knee jerk reaction, one of the auditors said, vote by mail. And all of us went, you know, vote by mail would solve these problems. And so that was a moment I believe Washington became a vote by mail state. So in 2005, the legislature allowed any county to move to vote by mail if they could get their legislative authority to give them approval. Um, 36 of the 39 counties moved that year and it still took five years for the remaining counties to move by, for, by, uh, to vote by mail. And that's really the message that I wanna get across is that it takes time to build in the capacity uh, in your counties or your local jurisdictions that actually do the work. And it takes time to build in the compensating controls of sending every single voter a ballot to their home. And I mention this because right now we are in the middle obviously of a very partisan discussion about the merits of vote by mail. And both sides have dug in and and are making very strong statements, shall we say. Uh, you know, there's one camp that believes we should have universal vote by mail availability. There's another camp that believes it's fraught with fraud and it will bring the ruin not only to a political party, but will we'll bring ruin to our elections. And as a, an election administrator caught in the middle of that, even though I'm partisanly elected, I'm an election administrator at heart, um, 
I am concerned. I am concerned that if we don't execute this well, that people will lose confidence in our elections. And so I guess my message to states really comes down to how close your state is to uh, high numbers of people who choose to get an absentee ballot every election is going to make it easier for you to transfer over completely to vote by mail or a vote at home environment. The further from that your state is, it's going to be a heavier lift. And uh, this is really where states have to, to make some critical decisions about how they're going to move forward. Um, the, some of the controls that we have here in Washington state that are just absolutely imperative to, and to inspire confidence include checking the signatures of either the application that is issued to the voter to get an absentee ballot or on our, in our case, when the ballot comes back in, we compare every signature on every return envelope to the signature on file. Um, this is important on, on a couple of fronts. You have to also have some sort of ability to uh, let the voter have a second chance. They will forget to sign the envelope. They will maybe have a signature that it's really outdated and will need to be updated. So you need to reach out to the voter. And that also gives a secondary check because if the ballot was returned erroneously or fraudulently, the voter is gonna let you know that that was not their ballot and you can begin a, an investigation. Um, the second thing is, is to do that, you're gonna have to have those signatures digitized. It needs to be an efficient process. And when we're talking about potentially hundreds of thousands of return envelopes, you have to have high speed sorters and equipment to deal with that. So all of those capacity issues and security issues really need to be thought through and, uh, and work through. And uh, in mechanical things like what is the, um, what is gonna be your, um, what do I wanna say? What are your, where, your parameters around voter intent? because my experience with vote by mail is voters are really creative. And I mean, really creative. They do things that you just couldn't anticipate. Uh, simple things like circling the names of the, the candidate they want rather than filling in the oval. And you need to have a robust set of guidelines so all of your local official, officials are actually checking those very consistently and so that you have um, consistent treatment of those. So those are just some of the off the top of my head things I would say, but, but mostly as a country, we've got to get past this partisan divide on this issue because the clock's ticking and every day that passes is one more lost opportunity to be able to do the things we need to do to pull off this election successfully and inspire confidence in our voters that it was fair and accurate. And the only way you do that is balancing access and security. And uh, my closing thought is that uh, no state in this country is escaping COVID-19. Even here in Washington, we are concerned about having enough staff to be able to process the ballots. Um, it's a very labor intensive process and each county needs to have enough staff and our workers are over 65. So I'll let you do the math. We have a big recruitment ahead of ourselves. And finally, um, you know, just the, 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 the real, um, the reality is that people are still gonna go into polling places or voting centers. They need to get replacement ballots. They need to uh, register for the first time for same day registration and that type of thing. So all of these things are coming at us and we have to find solutions and we need to stop the partisan bickering. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna end on that note. <laughs> and I'm gonna hang up that other phone that's making a noise right now. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Secretary. That was uh, great. It turns out we actually have Senator Hunt on the line, um, and I thought he might like to make a comment. Uh, Senator, do you want to unmute yourself and uh, uh, share with us uh, your experience with being the champion for this uh, back then? I have been unmuted. I'm envious of Secretary Wyman because she's in her office, and our offices have been locked for two months. Oh. We can't even get in. So, you know. That's the advantage of being in the executive branch. Yes, just saying. <laughs> just saying. Well, I, I think I think Kim did did a very good job. You know, with all the discussion we have on vote by mail, I want to emphasize. I, I think Kim did too. It's not something you just turn around and do. You're only as good as your list verification and and processing. And if you don't have a secure list, a good list. If you don't have the ability, the people trained to match the signatures when they come in and to make sure that, you know, the name matches the address and that sort of thing, and then correctly process it, uh, you're going to have trouble like any other election. So there is a huge human factor in, in what we do here. And, uh, you know, I've seen several things, you know, that 
course, there was the one instance in California where some apartment got nine ballots or something. Uh, you know, that's not the fault of vote by mail. That's the fault of uh, not having a properly processed list and, uh, you know, keeping that list up to date and stuff. So we do this by second nature now. I think if you try to tell the Washington voters that, hey, we're going to go back and have poll voting, you'd probably have a revolt on your hands because it's become just a part of regular life with elections. We do our, what we do, four elections a year, Kim, two specials and then the in the spring for schools and stuff and then the primary and the general, they're all conducted by mail. And we also, I would add, started providing uh, last year with, with Kim's leadership and, and our hard work, uh, postage paid return ballots. So we have a, a complex or not a complex, but a comprehensive system of drop boxes and if you fill out your ballot and throw it in a mailbox, you don't have to look for a stamp. As my kids say, what's a stamp? So I think, you know, if you plan and work properly, it, it's the way to go, but don't plan to do it overnight. That's it. Great, thank you, uh, Senator. Um, that was kind of a nice lead in for Amber McReynolds. I think she can probably play off of what, what you and uh, Secretary Wyman have had to offer. So Amber, take it away. Sure, well, thanks, Wendy. And thanks to NCSL for inviting me to participate. Um, always great to be with my friend, Kim Wyman, uh, who we, we th there's always a vote by mail, vote at home table at the national conferences. <laughs> um, and also with Paul Gronke, uh, both, both actually Kim and Paul are on our, um, Circle of Advisors for the National Vote at Home Institute, which is, which is one of the things that makes our organization unique in that we've, uh, we're a nonprofit and we've, we've maintained this very nonpartisan um, uh, uh, perspective and, and we've built a Circle of Advisors group that includes election officials, researchers, um, advocates, all kinds of different people that, um, that we really rely on to drive, to drive our work. Um, so uh, I, as Wendy mentioned, I, I'm the CEO for National Vote at Home now. Uh, formerly, I was the elections director in the city and county of Denver for a long period of time and an election official for 13 years. Um, and so I, I was part of the transition in Colorado in that we, uh, I, I ran elections at the polling, uh, with polling places. And then, and then over time, um, Coloradans started to ask for their ballots uh, repeatedly every election cycle. And we saw this huge growth. And, um, and what we tried to do is, you know, look at Washington and Oregon, what they had done, and add to it. So we, we added things like vote centers on election day uh, in a massive way with, with a large scale uh, operation, mainly because we also implemented same day registration uh, with our reform. And so we looked at it as we kind of did this comprehensive change, if you will, in Colorado back in 2013. Uh, the interesting thing is we passed and signed that legislation in May of 2013 and implemented it for the first time in the November 2013 election. So in about a five month span, which is actually similar to what a lot of states are trying to face right now in terms of scaling operations and modifying processes. Um, the other thing I, I, I would just share is sort of, uh, I come at this uniquely positioned as someone who did transition a system, who, do, who does know the benefits of it, who does know what it takes to scale. And so one of the, a couple of the things that we've been doing at the National Vote at Home Institute is recognizing that this is a significant undertaking as Secretary Wyman mentioned, and, and that many states have had very small percentages of vote by mail. And what that means is with their low percentages under 10%, what I always say when you think about an operation or you think about a system, a lot of times when you have that small volume, you don't recognize how many policy flaws might be associated with it, how much time it might take to deal with mail ballots when you have that kind of small, small um, footprint of using them. And you also might not be fully aware of the impact of some of the policies that are restrictive on voters and create barriers, but are also problematic from an election administration perspective. So we're kind of dealing with a very, almost a tsunami kind of situation in that there's antiquated laws on the books in states across the country. And I posted the link to the, the 50 state matrix that we uh, put out with policy recommendations by state, because what we did is we did a deep dive into 30 plus different policy objectives that relate to vote at home and relate to absentee voting and vote by mail. 
and we analyzed and ranked states as to where they are and made uh, uh, policy recommendations as to what states should do now and should consider doing in the future. And part of the reason that we did that is, you know, we were, we were number one, trying to help states implement and scale these systems, but number two, faced with a lot of policy challenges that, that exist in states right now. And again, like I think we're dealing with a, a, an emergency situation with COVID and how we can make sure people can vote in a safe, secure, effective way. But at the same time, we also have to scale a system that has mostly relied on antiquated laws across the country. And believe me, they are antiquated. I, I can go into great detail about um, <laughs> the significant issues, whether it be affidavits or uh, canvas timelines post-election or what have you. There are, there are antiquated laws on this topic across the country. Uh, so we try to collate all that in, in, a, in a set of recommendations uh, that covers every single state. And by the way, we, we don't even think that the states we gave five stars to have everything right. There's actually suggestions that um, can enhance Washington, Oregon, and Colorado. <clears throat> and, we, and, we, and we do that in there. We try to do that to uh, kind of continuously improve the systems, if you will. Um, and so, you know, we're facing an emergency. We're trying to respond quickly. And there's really only a few ways to scale this in a meaningful way that doesn't overwhelm election officials and overwhelm the system. And we just saw examples of this happening in states like Wisconsin, where within a three-week period, they were 120,000 vote by mail requests to 1.4 million. And that backlog of applications processing that, some of the constraints they have in their laws on election officials and how things get processed, all created a very difficult situation, not only for voters, but for election officials. And I kind of like to say that, you know, they got so much done and accomplished with basically one hand tied behind their back because they have a lot of outdated laws and policies on this issue. Uh, so Wisconsin is a great example of what could happen for every state if we don't make adjustments now. Um, as Secretary Wyman mentioned, you know, the, on the nonpartisan front, I, the one thing I always say is this is not, elections should never be a partisan issue. It should be about a technical Im implementation of a process that makes sure we can process every American within a 30 day period. And by the way, there's no other government service or entity or anything that serves every single one of their customers in a 30 day period. This is it. This is the one, this is the one area where that happens. Um, you know, we have laws on the books that, that make it difficult for election officials to do their jobs. And we have to figure out a way to make sure that they can do it and adjust in a timely manner so that we get results accurately and on, t and on time, or at least after the election in an appropriate way. Um, and there's things that have to happen now for that to, ha to occur. Um, one of the other documents and, and recommendations and strategy plans that we put out um, contemplates thinking about this in a completely different way and perhaps looking to operationalize some of the way that ballots are processed on the outbound side of things and also on the inbound side of things in a more centralized way. And there's a couple of examples of where some of those recommendations have already been taken up and, and where they're also being implemented. Um, for instance, on the outbound process, Maryland and Georgia are both examples of states where they contracted the mailing of ballots at the state level. And the reason that that kind of speeds up the process is that gives the third party vendor that's doing that work one point of contact to get the data files, to get the set of envelopes, to get all of that work through one place instead of 159 counties in Georgia. Um, so both those two states decided to do that. And I think that was a good decision on their part because it also lifted the burden of processing all of those ballots manually on the outbound side from the counties. Um, the other example of where that's happening is Rhode Island. Rhode Island is also doing that at the coordinated at the state level. And Rhode Island has also centralized the, the process inbound. So all the ballots, no matter what county, no matter what locality, they come into one location in Rhode Island. And, and they've bought equipment, they're getting a larger sorter, they're doing that because that's gonna lift the burden of that paper process, signature verification, all of that off of the localities so that the localities can focus on delivering in-person voting services uh, and all of those other election activities that have to happen. They're essentially lifting that kind of burden of paper and process and, and envelopes off of them. So I just say all of that because in our strategic plan, if, if and I can put the link up for this, 
we actually recommend this, that states that, that don't have a lot of uh, mail ballot voting traditionally think about regionalizing or centralizing some of these operations because they can leverage larger scale equipment with less people to process more ballots. So it's sort of a more systems way of thinking about it. Um, the last thing I would just say uh, in kind of in closing is um, we, this, is, this is an extraordinary situation. We have to come up with extraordinary creativity and solutions to actually get voters across the finish line in November. And so there's sort of what are we gonna do now and what do we do maybe on a temporary basis? And then there's a second question of, well, what does this look like long-term? Um, and so I think we, it's, while we need to talk about the two, we shouldn't conflate the two. We need to get an emergency situation addressed now and make good decisions for that. Um, but at the same time of all of that, we also have an opportunity to strengthen and improve our democracy and our election infrastructure and systems that are supporting it. Um, because as we see, and, and I don't have my slides to show this, but every single election cycle, we see the same headlines. We see five and six hour lines. We see mal machine malfunctions. We see bomb threats on polling places. That happens almost every single time. We see cars running into polling places. That also happens every single election cycle. And we also see the same narrative of it's hard for election officials to find enough people to support the election. And now it's even harder with COVID. Um, so all of those things basically mean that we have work to do. We have work to do across the country in every single state. And what we're trying to do is help um, uh, make suggestions in a, in a, in a data-driven way uh, that, that, that contemplate not only solving problems for today, but also uh, looking at changes for the future. So thanks for having me, Wendy, um, and I'm, I look forward to, to the rest of the conversation. Um, before I move on to uh, Paul, I want to ask you, Amber, it seems like a lot of what you talked about has to do with supply chain. Uh, and we are hearing that phrase in regard to uh, medical supplies. Is there some parallel there? Yes, it's a, it's a perfect parallel, Wendy, and I think you and I have talked about this before. It's sort of with when COVID hit, there wasn't enough medical supplies in place and that hadn't been contemplated. And so it took time for that to happen. I've heard a lot, a lot of people are trying to order masks online right now and it's taking a long time because a lot of that wasn't in place, right? So the early planning now, like right now in May, not in August, not in September, right now has to happen for election officials to get the equipment they need to put orders in for paper and envelopes and all these things that are that are increasing exponentially because it's not up to elected officials, it's not up to secretaries of state, it's not even up to local election officials to decide how voters are choosing to vote. They're choosing this method of voting in exponential numbers like we've never seen before. And it's frankly up to voters. Voters get to decide if they wanna vote by mail or not. It doesn't matter what a talking head on TV says or a bully pulpit or, or a politician or anywhere. It doesn't matter what anyone tells them. They're gonna to choose to vote in the method that they choose and we're seeing exponential increases in that right now. Gotcha, well, thank you very much. Um, Paul, we're gonna to turn to you and uh, ask you to um, tell us a little bit about what voting by mail has meant to, from a political scientist's point of view. Absolutely, thanks, Wendy, and I'm glad to be here, glad to join Secretary Wyman, Kim, I hope I can call you Kim, since we've known each other for many years, and Amber uh, McReynolds. Uh, you know, I've been trying to respond to some of the field, some of the questions in the chat as well, and, um, you know, a lot of questions coming in from a lot of directions. What I really wanted to start with here, Wendy, is to provide people a couple resources so they can really inform themselves. Um, sources that I would identify, and I think the panelists would agree, are, are comprehensive, are trustworthy. Uh, you know, we're in a dangerous situation right now where misinformation um, and anecdotes are flying around. And, you know, anecdotes aren't data. That's a political scientist speaking. But, I, Wendy, I know you agree. And, you know, one of the resources I want to start with is the NCSL, National Conference of State Legislatures, for those who don't know it. I've known Wendy for many, many years. And in part, the reason that many political scientists know of Wendy and the NCSL is NCSL has become our go-to spot to look at the legals and statutory requirements nationwide um, for absentee voting, for no excuse voting, for voter ID requirements, for any of a variety of legal and statutory um, requirements around voting and actually all kinds of things. So NCSL is a great site. I can't tell you how many times I've searched NCSL absentee early voting page to just get the update on where things stand. So that's one source. Second, of course, is the National Voter at Home Institute. Um, you know, Amber McReynolds was charming enough not to 
um, pitch her home website, which is amazing. The, she did link the 50 state matrix, which is great. There's other resources there, um, including some research I've conducted. I'm going to talk a little bit about the political science research, uh, but if you want to know more, uh, many of those resources are linked on the resources page at the National Vote at Home Institute. Um, my own website, evic.read.edu, you can find it, early voting at Reed College. We have resources. And then the Federal Election Assistance Commission has um, a lot of resources they've been putting out to help uh, both administrators, but also voters navigate this very complex situation. Um, Secretary Wyman and Amber McReynolds appear on a series of, of videos that they also have available for people to view. Um, it's a number of hours of viewing. So you might want to get ready in the evening if you're going to watch all those videos, uh, but it's really very informative perspectives from all over the country about the kind of challenges that election administrators are facing um, as they try to adapt. So I'm going to partition my comments into two parts. Um, I've been asked to speak to um, the impact of vote by mail as far as we know um, and how it deals with the uh, interacts with the partisan divide. I'm going to speak to a few minutes to that. And then um, what we know about local election officials around the country uh, and their feelings about change and reform um, because of a project that we have been engaged in um, for the past three years in surveying and, and elevating and amplifying the attitudes of local election officials. So let me start with partisanship. Th th there's been active questions on the chat about uh, partisanship and vote by mail. Um, I wanna echo something that both Secretary Wyman and Amber McReynolds have said. Um, in an ideal world, election administration would be a, a technological, administrative, bureaucratic issue. Um, it would not be one of partisanship. Now, I'm not naive, and nobody among these speakers I would call naive. We understand that politicians get elected in elections, including some uh, elected officials, like uh, Secretary Wyman, is elected in a partisan election. Um, yet Secretary Wyman is a model for many in the nation who've shown that election administration is perceived in a nonpartisan objective fashion, even if you're elected uh, in a partisan election. That would be the ideal world. Unfortunately, that's not the world we're in. It's a very competitive political environment. And so, you know, I can respond globally to some of the questions in the chat screen about why election administration has become partisan. And that's because um, it, it's heavy partisan competition and uh, you know, politicians don't like uncertainty. And for some politicians in states where there hasn't been extensive uh, voting by mail, there's some uncertainty about what that would mean. I would like to assure uh, those politicians, if I could, uh, the research to date has shown that there's no consistent advantage to either political party. Uh, voting by mail, all of these varieties of methods, early in-person voting, the party and the candidate that's benefited is the party and candidate that's best organized that has the most money um, or the best resources or the best personnel and can get to voters. Um, and you know, vote by mail is a method of, um, of uh, sending ballots. It's also a method of mobilizing voters that candidates adapt to quite quickly. Um, and they contact voters in somewhat different ways. Here in Oregon, we receive a lot of our communications through the mail, not surprisingly. Um, frankly, if, if you don't like endless campaigning, you should love the kind of system we have in Washington and Oregon and Colorado. Really, mobilization doesn't start for us until about 18 days before the election because that's when our ballots arrive. There's really no reason to um, get much information to us until that point. Um, nonetheless, you know, vote by mail or no excuse absentee balloting has been used throughout the nation. I should remind everyone that absentee balloting has been around since the Civil War, 1864, 150 years. No excuse absentee balloting started in 1978. It's been around for 40 years. Um, and full vote by mail systems with universal ballot delivery. And these are different systems, keep in mind. But the full universal ballot delivery system used in Washington, Oregon, Colorado, Utah, and Hawaii, those systems have been in place since 2000. So these are mature systems. Secretary Wyman is exactly right. It takes a while to really get them to work, to get them to hum. Um, Amber McReynolds pointed out some of the um, challenges that you're faced, but, but these, these are not new things, um, particularly the no excuse system that's been around for a very long time. What do we know about turnout? Uh, turnout, the effects are small. They're significant, but small, two to 4% is the average um, estimate. Uh, that shouldn't really surprise people. What motivates people to vote, to get out to um, either to the polls or to fill out those ballots it's less about the mechanics and more about the candidates and politics of our time. Uh, and that's what gets people out to vote. So I don't wanna say that making uh, ballot access, uh, making the hurdles to both registration and access as low as possible is important. It absolutely is important. 
Um, but the impacts here are not large. Uh, the big impacts are, are candidates that matter to people and, and policies in a political system that people think uh, matters for them. And really, that's what concerns me about the rhetoric that we've all talked about um, that's going on right now, is that you know there, there are policies that appear to be being followed to keep people away from the polls. And that's really unfortunate. That's unfortunate for all political parties, for all candidates. I think all candidates benefit when as many people are on the rolls, as many people are participating as possible, because that's how we get a democratic political system and a responsive political system. Um, so I, I think we should get as many ballots to as many people as want them as possible while assuring security and the integrity of the system. And that's going to give us a system with higher turnout because people will care and people will care because politicians have to listen. Um, and so that's, I think, what we're all trying to work for here. So now I want to turn finally to what we know about local election officials. And we've been engaged in a project called Stewards of Democracy, um, supported by the Democracy Fund. Um, you know, I, I've actually uh, talked with Amber McReynolds and um, uh, Wendy Underhill and Secretary Wyman about this project multiple times. So we've sent out um, surveys to local election officials. that have got a thousand responses in 2018 and 2019. We're in the midst of planning for 2020. And here's what I can say about you know, local election officials generally and with respect to you no know, excuse balloting and, and vote at home. So generally, it's important for everyone to understand the enormous diversity in election administration in the United States. We have over 10,000 local jurisdictions. Um, these vary from jurisdictions like Los Angeles County with over 6 million voters. Um, it's a small country, uh, Maricopa County, um, you know, Harris County, Texas. These are big, complex jurisdictions. On the other hand, we have Loving County, Texas, less than 200 registered voters. Um, we have small uh, jurisdictions in, in Michigan and Wisconsin um, with a few hundred voters. So it's really impossible in my mind to talk about the population of local election officials in the United States without understanding these vast levels of diversity. And so here's what we know about these kinds of changes that not surprisingly, there's diversity. Um, local election officials in states that already have um, modest to high levels of no excuse absentee balloting express a great deal of comfort with increasing that level. Um, that's because they already have the best practices in place. They already understand how to process these ballots. Uh, they all already understand how to, how to manage their voter pool. And local election officials in places where these systems have not been in place express more discomfort. It's not that they reject these reforms, but they uh, express uncertainty and they want to know more. They know more from leaders like Secretary Wyman, Amber McReynolds, um, Steve Trout in my own state, where they've had the experience. Um, we, we found many of the same findings with respect to um, online voter registration, with automatic voter registration. I don't know what this is. It's new. It's different. And I'm under a lot of scrutiny here. Um, so give me information and, and help me uh, be comfortable. What I can say what's going on nationally and in many states is that um, policy leaders are, are engaging with state legislators, they're engaging with policymakers, they're engaging through um, webinars like this to ease the comfort level and make sure that this adaptation, which is going to come, I mean, uh, Amber is exactly right. We saw it in Wisconsin where absentee ballot requests were up tenfold. We've seen it in Nebraska. We've seen it in Pennsylvania. We've seen it in every single state. So absentee ballot requests are gonna go up and states need to be ready, they need to prepare. And um, you, know, you don't wanna put local election officials in the position of making these decisions. Um, you wanna have it done at the state level so local election officials have some guidance. I'll close just with one example. It's not really about vote by mail, but it's an act of controversy right now, but I think illustrates this issue. So in Texas, um, you can request an absentee ballot if you have a disability. Now, what does it mean to have a disability? Do we want local election officials who have no investigatory power to be in a position of having to uh, mediate what a disability constitutes? So right now the state and local officials and judges and lawyers are fighting about what that means. I, I think that's very regrettable. Even if for just one election, they can perhaps lower the bar a little bit on disability, that would be my recommendation. But this is gonna get fought out in court. I don't want local election officials to be put in the middle here. That's not where we want them to be. That's why we have people like Secretary Wyman. Uh, the buck stops at the state level with an elected Secretary of State, and that's where those decisions should be made, not piecemeal by local election officials. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Paul. That was excellent. You uh, touched on all the points we'd asked you to do, uh, so I really appreciate that. And now it is time for questions, and we have quite a number of them. Uh, the first one is for you, Secretary Wyman, if you want to unmute. Uh, this came in advance from Michael Epling. Um, how does a jurisdiction recruit enough bipartisan poll workers to administer the election during a pandemic, given that seniors are at significant risk? And I'm throwing this to you because you mentioned it, and I know your poll workers are very different than other poll workers, but you still have the same issue. So could you give us a little more on that, please? Uh, absolutely. Thank you for asking. Uh, this is a, a topic that is hitting every state across the country um, head on. Uh, poll workers or even um, people who process uh, mail-in ballots, uh, by and large, are retired personnel. I would say the average age of our uh, seasonal election workforce is 70, and I'm not exaggerating. Uh, the vast majority of our workers in, in uh, every county in the state are, are retired people, by and large. And these are the very people who are not going to be able to work because of um, being in the highest risk group for COVID-19. And that is true for polling place workers, vote center workers. Uh, it really doesn't matter what, what method of voting your state uses. This is going to be true across the board. Um, I've been working with a group called Business for America, and we're re I'm really excited. Um, I, I might be spilling the beans, but uh, we uh, had a conversation about how can business help? You know, they, they, they're frustrated like many of us are, I think, of just we all want to solve these problems in front of us and, and how do we do that? And so in this conversation, I just threw out this, this you know, idea that probably half to two thirds of our workforce are not gonna be able to come into work in the elections this fall. And out of that, we are going to try to do a national recruiting effort to um, partner businesses and local governments and even, uh, quite honestly, uh, the nonprofit sector uh, and let kind of let the market help help solve this. Um, when you think about uh, this, this real big recruitment effort we need to have in each state, uh, why don't we find out about companies like Levi and Patagonia that already were planning on doing voter outreach to their employees and giving their employees a day off on election day or giving them time off to work and volunteer at a polling place or, or work in an election office. If we can connect those resources with some sort of like questionnaire that maybe the local jurisdiction can fill out, we need masks, we need shields, we need hand sanitizer, whatever it might be, connect the, those needs with the people that might be able to provide it. Um, just in a early conversation, we have a company here in Lacey called Ecos, which does, uh, you know, healthy uh, cleaning products. And they said, we'd love to provide hand sanitizer. We just can't do it for the whole country. So, you know, you look at that regionalization that, that if we could be doing this and help states connect uh, their local government with uh, business and nonprofit sectors, I think we have a, a shot at doing this. That's great that you have good partners there in Washington for you. And I'm familiar with that brand. Um, Paul, question for you. Um, does moving to all mail, this comes from Laura Siegel, moving to um, mail voting have to be permanent? Uh, once you've done it that way, is, is the state committed to that forever? Do you have any sense of whether any states have gone one direction and then shifted or, or is it a one way track? Well, the historical record, Wendy, I, I believe that's a good question that I should know the answer to. I believe the historical record is that once a state um, allows for a no excuse balloting system. And I, I do want to make sure that all of the viewers and listeners understand, for me, there's a very, there's an important distinction here between no excuse balloting, uh, which is used in, in Wendy. Can we look up your website? I think it's <laughs> four states right now. Uh, there's a great map. Um, uh, no excuse absentee balloting versus the full universal ballot delivery system to every registered voter. So um, uh, nonetheless, so I, I don't know of any state that moved to no excuse balloting and then has removed that option. Um, and, and I think the reason is that once voters, um, once that option is available, the, the segment of the population uh, that votes that way continues to vote that way. And they, they're like, it was a question actually very early on. Do people habituate? And there is some evidence of some habituation that people um, vote that way and like to vote the way. Let me also say, Wendy, uh, you know, and I don't want to speak for Amber here, but if she wants to chime in, election officials, in my experience, the ones that I've spoken to, and I defer to them because they have the experience. I'm an academic sort of examining them under a microscope. And believe me, sometimes they tell me, please turn off the microscope, have a drink with me instead, or a coffee. Um, nonetheless, election officials, um, other than the expense, mind you, um, tend to like the method as well because it spreads out the election day demand. 
Um, and that's why a lot of states actually adopted these systems after 2000. So we didn't have all the stress uh, on the polling place on election day. But you know, the quick answer is no. States tend not to move backwards um, when they provide more options. Voters tend to move to those options. I, I can add. I can add a little bit on that if that's okay, Wendy. Absolutely. Um, a couple of things. I mean, first off, we've never seen a state adopt a full vote at home system and then go back the other way. That's that's never been the case. Uh, when I was in Denver, we did run a primary election by mail where we sent a ballot to everyone because we were allowed to do that for primaries and for local elections. And then a couple months later, we did not do that for the general election. And the number of calls with upset people that did not receive their ballot automatically was significant. And the only reason I say that here is that, you know, you think about how many people right now are voting at home uh, during their primary elections. And in a lot of these states where that application is not good for the general, they're going to have to sign up again. They may think they're signed up and then they're going to be very upset come November if they don't get that ballot automatically. So uh, I will say that, you know, all the trends and in a lot of states that have done this over time, uh, the majority of people, for instance, in Colorado, they get their ballot mailed to them at home. Over 95% use the ballot that was mailed to them. We still offer in-person voting, but it's fairly small and limited, uh, you, less than 5% for sure, and usually more like 1%. Uh, so I just, I think when people do that, it, they, they sort of don't trend back. And so that'll be another interesting uh, data point that'll come out of COVID is, will that trend reverse itself? Um, the other thing that I will say on this is that, you know, the, the analogy of this, just to kind of put it in perspective is, you know, you order something online, whether it's Amazon or whatever, and it comes to you. And that's kind of what we do here with balloting. We're, we're sending you your ballot. It's more of an opt out system uh, in a lot of the vote at home states where you don't have to sign up. It just comes to you. Um, but you still have that option to vote in person. So it's a, a distinct thing. You're signing up, you're essentially buying your product online by requesting the ballot. It comes to you at home. The um, sort of reverse of that and the analogy is if you buy something online like a product like Amazon and you, sign, you register or, or what have you and you say you wanna vote, it'd be like Amazon assigning you to a place to go stand in line and, and wait for you to get your product. That's kind of what we do with polling places in a lot of ways. So if we look at just how many people now order their groceries online and their products come to their homes or their Lyft and Ubers come to them, there's also a consumer aspect of this, of how do people, how are people gonna behave when they have this option presented to them? And when you just look across the consumer world of how things are changing, uh, from a shopping perspective and all those different things, it sort of guides me at least to believe that there's going to be a significant shift here in how people interact once they have these additional options. Great. Uh, thank you. Amber, I'm going to hold off on a couple of other questions for you and, and go back to Secretary Wyman. Uh, Norman Lee asks, is the signature verifi verification conducted by staff doesn't that make it a su subjective call? And someone else asked about uh, signature verification with an eye towards digitalization and OCR. So could you tell us a little bit more about in a small county and in a big county, how that signature verification is conducted? Well, like, like I was mentioning with uh, voter intent, having consistency among counties, we try to achieve that also with our signature verification. So each county has anyone who's going to do signature checking, uh, have training annually with the Washington State Patrol. And, uh, and they're by no means any kind of signature experts. They're not fraud experts. But this training does, you would be amazed at uh, the tool it gives you to be able to look at a signature and see the consistency with which people sign their name. And uh, by and large, what we found is that most people's signature over the course of their life stays pretty similar. There are two points in, in their life where it changes dramatically. The first is uh, the beginning of their life, their voting life, at least 18 to 25, typically women. Uh, their signature is really cute. It has a heart over the eyes and it's sweet. And then they get a job or they, they go to college and they get in the workforce and they become more mature. And that signature by and large stays pretty consistent till towards the end of their life. Uh, it might be Parkinson's or a stroke or some physical ailment that changes it. But in that, that course of that time, it's a, a consistent way we sign. And that's what the signature training really is about, is kind of almost tra tracing that pen uh, mark. And then those 
that's just the first pass. Um, if they don't think it matches, it goes through at least three or four more levels of more experienced checkers. Ultimately, anything that's called into question, be a missing, be in a missing signature or a mismatch signature, the voter is notified and has an opportunity to cure that signature. And again, that's a secondary fraud check uh, as well if they didn't return the ballot. Uh, finally, uh, we are looking at you know um, possibly doing OCR, some sort of automated check of those signatures right now. Uh, I think people are really comfortable hand, having that uh, eyes on real human being do it. But, uh, but from a throughput standpoint, it is a, a bottleneck that does slow the process down. So that's kind of where we're at. Great. Um, I can tell you all that my daughter did the, what you suggested about the hearts and, and, and such over the, uh, her signature. And when she matured from 16 to 18 and voted, uh, we vote in Colorado, uh, her signature did not match and she was alerted to this fact and had the opportunity to cure it. So I can speak to that really working. Um, hey, Wendy, just two, yeah. and I, I suspect it works this way in Washington as well, but just to chime in on, on two things. One, just to stress what the secretary said, um, it's not only that there are multiple layers, it's not like one person has the call, but it goes up and then the voters given an opportunity to cure. Secondly, there are external observers that can watch this process. So it's not like this process is some, some, some sort of vault. Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, and the third thing is, and I, I don't know if this is the case in Washington and other states. In Oregon, I've watched this happen. They have the history of your signature. Um, and so you can watch that signature over time. So it's not like if you uh, sign something really quickly at some point, they won't be able to validate it. They got the signature that you have produced over time. So they have multiple examples. With me, it's the G. I use a Midwestern G, it looks like this. And boy, they show me my signature and my P and my G are really consistent over time, even though I might scribble the rest. So it's actually, a lot of election, many election officials, all election officials I know are really welcoming for people who want to observe who come watch or learn about the process. I encourage anyone to go there and watch this happen. These folks really know what they're doing. Right. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, Amber, I want to come back to you uh, for just a moment, and that is to have you talk about voter registration. We've got a couple of questions that discuss whether registration, uh, how does that relate to ballots that might be sent out to people who actually shouldn't get a ballot, um, people who are falling off the rolls. Um, and so can you express a little bit more about how voter registration might be the first step towards uh, running a clean mail election? Well, yeah, sure. It's and it's a great question, um, and it's and it's all interrelated. Uh, it's the first way. It's it's how the data lists are created, right? Is through that voter registration process. And what I would say is, again, similar to some of the other election laws that are on the books around the country, uh, there's there's a lot to be desired when it comes to voter registration, meaning that you know the systems really haven't been very efficient, haven't modernized over time, and we're starting to see more work done on that uh, as of late, but. You know, sy systems like automatic registration and automatic address updates are really important in ensuring the integrity of the process because what we want to do is the minute that the voter fills out a change of address or does an interaction with a government agency, we don't want to make them fill out another piece of paper to get that information across other government agencies. So the better way is to try to capture that at different points in the process so that um, so that uh, electors get their addresses updated in an efficient way and our voter lists are clean. So if you look at states that have the highest voter registration rates, the cleanest lists, the least underlivable ballots, all of those sorts of things, it's actually a lot of the states that we're talking about right now, it's Colorado, it's Oregon, Washington, they have the, the best lists in the country because we've, we've number one, modernized a lot of voter registration aspects with automatic and, and address updating We've also incorporated the use of national change of address data automatically in the process to check addresses, update addresses accordingly. And then we also interact with the voter file more, more frequently than a lot of states that don't do this. Um, and then all of those states as well have joined what's called ERIC, which is a, a conglomerate of states that, uh, that, that look at voter registration data, shared voter registration data, share that cross uh, state moves, and then update address records accordingly. All of that has made those states better in terms of list maintenance. States like Texas, for instance, that haven't been a part of ERIC, don't have a lot of mail ballot voting, don't have automatic registration, have very restricted voter registration deadlines, and don't do a lot to automatically update addresses, have lists that aren't as accurate, right? So states that kind of have modernized voter registration, made it easier, have a much more 
um, are, are, are sort of have better lists that are more accurate than, than states that don't have a lot of this. Um, but there's still ways to improve some of this today and for this election cycle, including things like running national change of address checks. So each state could do that now and then do an outreach to voters. Uh, there's also you know, a way to do uh, postcard mailings. Hawaii just uh, did a postcard mailing to make sure signatures were up to date. They, they did a whole mailer for their electors and that's one way to, to do outreach. So there's things that can be done now and there's ways to analyze that data and, and sort of improve it over time. Great, I appreciate that. Um, we are coming close to the top of the hour, so I wanna get to um, one of the really toughest questions that we've had today, and it came from um, Barbara Cattle. Uh, how can we get past the partisan divide? And Secretary Wyman, I'm gonna ask you to go first, but I'm gonna ask everyone to address that and any last minute things that you wanna share with this audience. Well, you know, it, it certainly being, uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm a Republican uh, elected official and, and right now with what's happening, I saw that Paul, what's happening uh, uh, across the country and, and certainly on uh, Twitter wars and things is, you know, just gasoline on the fire. And I think that um, there have certainly been calls for me to, you know, you need to denounce the president or you need to challenge him or whatever. It's like, no, that just is one more, it's just taking the bait. What we need to do is elevate the conversation above partisanship. And you know what, in, in, in January, when the legislatures come back and uh, you know, in states like mine, where it's not a full-time legislature, we can have all those partisan debates and we can debate the merits, uh, pro and con of any type of voting system. And that's the appropriate place for it. Right now, we have a monumental problem in front of us. And as Americans, we have to come together as a country, put the partisanship aside. We also have to recognize that we view it through our partisan lens. Every one of us views every one of these changes through our partisan lens, and we can't let that blind us. We have to be able to say what's important is that every eligible voter in this country in November gets to vote. It's that simple. Our job is to protect their rights and make sure that they have that ability. And whatever we need to do to inspire confidence that it was a fair and accurate election we need to do. And so um, I'm just gonna keep standing on that soapbox until, <laughs> until it happens <laughs> and lead by example. I, I think that what I'm most proud of in my association with the, the secretaries of state right now, we have partisanly elected secretaries of state. Many of us were former, I mean, some of us were former activists, some of us were election workers, some of us were legislators and we all have our partisan stripes. But what I've found in this situation is we're checking those at the door and we're trying to come together to find a solution. And that's where we need to be spending our time. Love it, thank oh, you God, so much. So much thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Amber, what, what can you share with us about um, overcoming the partisan divide? Sure, well, I, a couple of things that I always say, um, I mean, first I'm an unaffiliated elector, always have been. And, um, and, and felt very strongly about, how, about an approach like that when I was running elections um, at the local level. Um, so I, I, for one, believe that election policy has to be about who votes and not who wins. And I think for too long, um, partisan policymakers have, have tried to kind of focus on, and it's, it's similar with redistricting, it's similar with some of the other aspects of the election process where they wanna to try to tip their hand or sort of give themselves an advantage with the rules of the game. And so to me, the rules of engagement, the rules of the game have to be fair and free from that partisan partisan politics aspect. And it has to be about who votes and making sure that that transaction, the voting transaction, and, and it actually works to get people across the finish line and, pe and people can vote in a safe, secure, accessible and accurate way. Um, the second thing I would say on that is, I, I completely agree with Secretary Wyman that you know, the, the, the partisan uh, sort of um, wars on Twitter and all of this um, that frankly are sort of beyond partisanship and are now just, uh, just uh, there's a lot of misinformation, uh, that, that deteriorates confidence and trust in the process. And it's no different from foreign adversaries spewing misinformation with bots and other things that we experienced in 2016. So we have to be vigilant about, about, uh, about calling that out, regardless of where it comes from, regardless of what side of the aisle it happens to be on. And then the final thing I would just say is, you know, the United States is fairly unique in that uh, election officials, whether they be at the local level or the state level, are elected in a, in a partisan way. A lot of other countries and democracies, it's, it's a technocratic kind of process. It's an administrative process. If you look at Canada or other places, 
there isn't this um, elected kind of uh, program. So the governance is different. And I think that, you know, in every state in the country right now, that's very different. Some are appointed at the local level, some are hired to be election administrators, some are, some are elected locally, um, some are elected in nonpartisan elections where it doesn't matter what partisanship you are. I think that's kind of one of the other things that we need to think about for the future is, is that governance structure working appropriately for what it needs to do, um, at, especially at the local level where those officials are making decisions about local locations, registered voters, signatures, all those sort of thing. I think we have to look at that governance structure and, and kind of really examine what's working and what's not and how we can improve it. Thank you, that's great. And Paul, will you bring it home for us, please? No, <laughs> I'll try. Listen, um, th there are really big questions about partisanship in this country. Um, this is, you know, I, I can only, I'll, I'm gonna sound like preaching to the choir here, singing the same song that Kim and Amber have been singing. I, I hope that we can move election administration itself out of uh, this partisan divide. I, I do believe you know, we could have a longer discussion. I do believe that really both political parties would benefit enormously. The partisan divides would reduce if we had more people on the rolls, if, if political strategies were not about keeping people away from the ballot box, but bringing them in, because then politicians would have to respond. And they would respond. I mean, if you look at states with higher turnout, you see that in the kind of political rhetoric that occurs in those states. But look, uh, Wendy, there, there are very big issues here about the direction this country has been going in 50 years. And uh, income inequality and a variety redistricting, you know, we could go long and deep into this question. All I will say to the listeners and viewers is, is be critical, be skeptical what you hear, try to find, uh, seek out information from diverse set of sources, um, and, and be creative. Um, you know, we've had geographic based re uh, registration, uh, uh, um, redistricting districts in this country for 200 years, um, but, you know, we could do things differently. Um, we could elect people in slightly different manners, um, and, and we could think about the rules of the game in a slightly different way. Um, so it, it's okay to celebrate, and of course it's important to celebrate the important and wonderful things about our country, but I do think sometimes we're a bit stubborn about looking to examples of other countries and other systems that do things maybe a little bit better than us. Um, so I would just say be creative. Don't automatically reject reforms and try to think about ways that reforms can actually improve the world and improve, improve your own lives at home. Got it. I appreciate that. What I'm thinking is those big uh, changes might come after the 2020 election. Right now, the focus is on running a really high quality election, which we can do in this nation in every state because the quality of our election officials. And that means that when absentee ballots are managed, they will be managed. Might take a little longer to do the reporting after the fact, but they will be managed. And in person, uh, voting, which was not the topic of today, is also going to be happening all across the nation. And um, folks are working just as hard on ensuring that the processes there are safe and secure for the voters and the poll workers as well. Now, we got close to all of the questions, but not quite all of the questions. If we didn't answer yours and you would like an answer, if you could send it to me at wendy.underhill at ncsl.org or my, my colleague Brian, brian.hinkle at ncsl.org. We'll try to get you an answer. And mostly I want to say a great big round of applause for Secretary Wyman, for Amber McReynolds, and for Paul Gronke for bringing us some really um, thought-provoking um, information today. So uh, thanks all. This is a Quaker uh, applause doing that. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks, Amber. You're thanks, welcome. Thanks, thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day.